excited to shout Hosanna because today is an exciting day, this Palm Sunday. So let us greet each other with shouts of Hosanna. Please be seated. Now we will have Deacon Hee Jung Kim lead us in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the indescribable love you have shown toward us through the death of your Son. Because of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, we have been re reconciled with God. Please let us be partakers of Christ's sufferings. Father God, we are gathered here with sincere hearts to worship you. Remember and bless all members of our ministries. We also pray for our pastors and missionaries. Empower them to work for your kingdom. When Pastor Joseph Kim delivers the word of God, may your words be a lamp unto my feet and light unto my path. We trust you to provide all that we need to live in obedience to your commands. Help us to follow your will for our life and to deny our own desires. Pour your Holy Spirit into our hearts that we may find our highest comfort in your grace. Protect us from temptations to see more and help us patiently bear whatever hardships may come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our scripture reading for today comes to us from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21, verses 1 to 11. Listen as Deacon Kwang Hyung Moon and Deacon Yoon Jung An lead us in the scripture reading. Listen to the word of God. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethlehem, on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there, with her colt by her, and tie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of donkey. The disciples went and did, as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large cloud spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna is the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The, the crowd answered, answered, This is Jesus, Jesus the, the prophet, prophet from Nazareth and Galilee. Galilee. Amen. 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 I want to extend a warm welcome to all of you joining us today for worship at Myungsung Church's English Worship Service, Awake Ministry. We are so glad to have you here on this Palm Sunday, and if you are joining us, for the first time, I invite you to come forward during our closing song as we would love to get to know you more. We would also love to have you help us lead worship by either leading us in scripture reading or prayer. If that is something that is close to your heart, I encourage you to speak to one of our secretaries as we would love to have you. Let us all continue in our prayers for the church and the nation and leadership during this pandemic. Let us also pray for all of those who are currently being affected by COVID. May they have a full recovery of health. Our elementary education department are now fully opened as of last week. So I invite us to all pray that all of our awake ministry services will remain healthy and holy. And finally, as our Lenten season is coming to a close, let us continue to devote ourselves 
for scripture and prayer as we enter into this Holy Week. Next, next week is our Easter celebration with the theme, The Reason for Hope, and the following Sunday will be our 23rd anniversary with the theme, Reaching Higher. So with so much to celebrate, let us prepare our hearts in prayer. Now we will have our Shoshana Choir leading us in the song, He is Jesus. Today we celebrate Palm Sunday, just one week now from Easter, uh, the most holiest of holidays. I hope that all of you were able to share in communion this week in the main sanctuary. Um, if you have not, then the fifth service ooh, is your last chance, the last chance. Uh, so I encourage all of you, if you have not, to go and participate to partake in the body and blood of Christ. And uh, I had the grace to be able to serve the communion in the second and third service, especially in the second service. A lot of our AM uh, members are in the orchestra and in the choir. And so I was able to share with a lot of them. It was a blessing to me. And the gown is very heavy. 
as running around handing out, you know, uh, the communion, the, the, the bread and the wine. And I think I lost about uh, one kilo of sweat today. <laughs> uh, but truly, by God's grace, you know, it's been two and a half years. It's hard to imagine, right? Two and a half years since we were able to participate in the Lord's Supper. And, you know, we're not Roman Catholic. Roman Catholics believe that the, the bread actually becomes the physical flesh of Christ. And the wine becomes the actual blood. We don't believe that. We believe that it is a symbol. But even so, this symbol is so important for us in our life of faith, isn't it? Our life of faith is made up of these symbols, these rituals, these uh, moments in the year throughout the calendar that ground us to Christ. So truly, it was a blessing for us to be able to have this celebration, the Lord's Supper, once again. Amen. Last Sunday, we saw that Jesus was still on his way to Jerusalem for the final time because we know that the events of Easter, Palm Sunday, Holy Week take place in Jerusalem. And we saw through the examples, the two examples of the two sons of Zebedee and the two blind men, we saw the difference between what people thought Jesus wanted and what Jesus actually wanted. People thought that Jesus wanted power and ability, good credentials, experience, ambition. But what Jesus actually wanted was a humble and broken spirit. He wanted people who depended on him, only on him. And so today, as we look at Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, we can see a similar tale. Again, we see two different sides. And so we want to explore just a little bit in today's sermon. And the two sides that we see are the worldly expectations versus the spiritual reality. In this event of Jesus entering into Jerusalem, we see the worldly expectations and the spiritual reality. And the worldly expectations of Jesus, how quickly they changed when they realized, the people, the crowds that were gathered saying, Hosanna, they realized Jesus was not who they expected and their opinion turned so quickly. Our senior pastor mentioned in his sermon today, their opinion changed so quickly of Jesus, 180 degrees. But there was a spiritual reality to Jerusalem as well as Jesus entered Jerusalem. And before we look at that, we have to think, why was it such a big deal for Jesus to enter Jerusalem on this day of all days? Is it a special event for you to enter the neighborhood where you go to work. When you come home every night, is there a crowd waiting for you? Welcome back to Bermito. No, right? For Jesus, he had been to Jerusalem many, many times. So why was this special? As an infant, Jesus had been taken to the temple. So before he could even walk or talk or do anything, Jesus was taken to the temple in Jerusalem to be consecrated because this was the tradition for all firstborn males in Israel. He was taken to the temple and presented. Even as a youth, it says that Jesus followed his earthly parents, Mary and Joseph, every single year to go up to Jerusalem during the festivals, the holidays, the high holidays. And of course, we know the most famous example of this. It says that one Passover year when Jesus was 12 years old, they had gone up to Jerusalem, they had offered their sacrifices, and they were on their way back home. And what happened? They're like, wait, where's Jesus? Where's our child? I mean, I know he's 12 years old, you know, especially in Korea, I know 12 years old, you can go to Pyeongchang by yourself, do whatever you want. But, you know, I'm thinking in Jerusalem, with all these people traveling, thousands of people from outside Jerusalem were coming, traveling to worship. And so in this huge crowd, how could you let your son go? They were like, where's Jesus? They were leaving 
okay, without Jesus. This is the funny part of the story. They weren't in Jerusalem and saying, oh, where did Jesus go? They were going home and they're like, oh, we forgot our son. And so they start looking frantically for him. Any parent here knows, right? If you're out somewhere and you don't see your child for 30 seconds, that's a big problem. They were searching frantically, where's Jesus, where's Jesus? But it says that they found him in the temple in Jerusalem. That he was teaching there to the people. And that the people around him were amazed at the wisdom and the insight that he had, this 12-year-old boy. He was very comfortable in Jerusalem. To that point, 12 years old. And when I was 12 years old, I couldn't even speak. If people ask me, what's your name? I'm like, uh, that was me at 12 years old, but Jesus was speaking and teaching these adults. He was comfortable in Jerusalem. That's how often he had been there. He was very familiar with the city. And after he left Jerusalem, it says that Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Jesus grew in wisdom, stature, in favor with God, in favor with man. These are important parts of his development process. And this is very important because a lot of early heresies claim that Jesus was not actually human, that he only appeared in his image to be a human, that he was never actually a human. And the argument, the heretical argument, okay, so this is not good. The heretical argument was that God could not, that God should not, would not take human flesh because human flesh this is dirty. This is filthy. There's no way God can take human flesh. But we know that the truth of the gospel, the truth of the gospel is that Jesus came and lived among us, that he really came and lived among us, that his flesh was real. Just as he said, reach out and touch the holes in my hands. I'm not a hologram, not just an image of a floating spirit. No, Jesus was real in the flesh, fully human, fully God. It was only because Jesus was fully human that he could stand as our representative because he was one of us. Jesus was our high priest, as we learn. But it was only because he was fully God that he could offer the one true sacrifice, the sacrifice that stood for all eternity. For all time. Because the earthly high priests had to go every single year again and again and again to offer sacrifices. It had to be renewed because they were only human. But Jesus, as fully God, was able to offer the once and for all sacrifice. All this is to say that Jesus was no stranger to Jerusalem. He was very comfortable there, even. And in fact, it was Jerusalem where Jesus always got into trouble. He was so familiar that he went and he caused trouble in Jerusalem. You know, if we look at the Gospels, they contain many stories of Jesus in Jerusalem, of him teaching there, of him performing wondrous miracles for the people, healing people, bringing people back from the dead and giving them sight and giving them the ability to walk again, all of these things. Jerusalem was the setting of conflict between Jesus and the religious authorities of that time. And of these religious authorities, there were two ruling factions. We've heard their name quite a lot, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. We know them, right? And the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they you know, coexisted, but they were kind of rivals, right? The Pharisees were like lawyers. They had studied. They were common people, but they studied. And by their studying, by their brains, as they studied the scripture, they rose in their position and became a Pharisee, a respected teacher. The Sadducees were like religious royalty. They were born into their position. And so... These two groups were rivals, but they coexisted to keep their power. 
And so they did not appreciate Jesus showing up because he was not a Pharisee and he was not a Sadducee, but he spoke as someone with authority. He spoke as someone with power and he made bold statements. He had insight in his teaching. He had power in his miracles that they could not match. Their leader, the high priest Caiaphas, he saw Jesus as a very direct threat, as a rival to his own position. See, he was used to being in power. Caiaphas was the longest ruling high priest in Jewish history. He did not want any risk to this established order, his control of power. And so this is a, a big political landscape that we see in Jerusalem, all these things going on. But another important piece of the puzzle was the Romans, of course. The Roman prefect, we all know him as Pontius Pilate. This position was very important. He didn't live in Jerusalem, but he was very close by in Caesarea. And in Caesarea, he had a small force, a security force of Roman soldiers. They probably say it was about 3,000. And it sounds like a lot, but it wasn't really that much because the Jewish people loved to revolt. They lo especially around these holidays, around Passover, you know, things got heated. But during these holidays, the Roman forces would come to Jerusalem to keep order, to keep peace, to make sure nothing got out of hand. And not only did they ensure order and safety with these large crowds, but they reminded the Jewish people, they say, remember who your master is. It's not Caiaphas, it's not Herod, it's Caesar. They were the embodiment of the Roman Empire. They ruled over Jerusalem and ruled over all of Israel. So Caiaphas, as the leader of the religious authorities, Pontius Pilate as the Roman representative, they were also kind of rivals, but cooperated. They coexisted because they said, we need to keep this order. This established order has to stay in place. So if we look at Jerusalem, the background of this, the, the political background, all of these power struggles, these alliances, you know, we watch these Netflix and HBO dramas, Game of Thrones, but Jerusalem was the original. There was so much going on here. So what did they think about Jesus? Why was this entry into Jerusalem different from all the others? First, I wanna look at where Jesus entered. You know, our senior pastor yesterday gave us a very blessed sermon about the walls and the gates of Jerusalem at the early morning service. There were many gates of Jerusalem, and Jesus could have chosen any gate. Our pastor mentioned yesterday there is a dung gate, right? I call it dung demun, right? It was literally a gate for waste, for human waste. And all of these gates that Jesus could have chosen, but he entered Jerusalem in this passage through the golden gate. The Golden Gate, also known as the East Gate. So if you ever have a Bible quiz, this is good trivia for you to know. Which gate did Jesus enter through? It was Pungdem. It was the Eastern Gate. The big Eastern Gate is where Jesus came through and entered into Jerusalem. And this gate was actually a double gate. It was like a double door. Right? And one door was called the door of mercy. The other door was called the door of repentance. What a good name. Quite a fitting name. But it wasn't because Jesus liked the name that he chose this gate, the golden gate, the gate of mercy, the gate of repentance, all of these great things. But it wasn't just the name. If we look at the golden gate, it was also a great location. The Golden Gate was the closest gate with direct access into the temple. So as soon as you entered, the temple was right there in front of you. It was the closest one. This was the gate that 
they used to bring animals in for sacrifices. It had direct access. That is why as soon as Jesus enters the gates, when he comes into Jerusalem, what is it that the first thing that he does? He sees the temple courts. He sees the money changers. He sees the people selling animals. And he makes a whip to drive them out. Because as soon as he entered the gate, he was at the temple court. This is the physical location of the golden gate. This was prime real estate. Not only that, once you left Jerusalem, if you left through the Golden Gate, it was directly in front of the Mount of Olives. And we see here the last named location Jesus stops before entering Jerusalem is the Mount of Olives. It was right in front of the Golden Gate. When Jesus left Jerusalem to go to pray, it says that he went to the Garden of Gethsemane. And again, the Garden of Gethsemane, this garden, is directly outside the Golden Gate. This shows us, Jesus shows us, it's important that your place of worship and your place of prayer is close by. It shouldn't be too far. All of you who come from very far away, God bless you. But if possible, your place of worship and your place of prayer should be close to home. For Jesus, everything was close by. Everything was located right at this golden gate. And so if we understand the, you know, the location, the distance of things for Jesus to choose this golden gate to enter into, it makes so much sense. But this was also not the reason Jesus chose the golden gate. It wasn't just for the name. It wasn't just for the convenience factor, right? The kyotong. No. Jesus entered through the Golden Gate because that was the gate that was prophesied by Ezekiel. For the Messiah, when he came into Jerusalem, this prophet saw in his vision that the glory of the Lord entered the temple through the gate facing east. Then the Spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. In fact, there is a tradition that when Jesus comes back again on that final day, when Jesus returns once again to this earth, which we are all waiting for, of course, that he will come through the eastern gate. And in fact, I found an interesting, uh, another piece of trivia. When Jerusalem, you know, of course, Jerusalem had been conquered by so many different people over the years. When Jerusalem was under the control of the Muslim Ottoman Empire, their ruler, the Sultan uh, Suleiman, he was so afraid of this prophecy because he had heard that the Messiah would come through the Eastern Gate. And you know, it's, it's important to note that Muslims actually have more uh, respect or regard for Jesus than the Jewish do, right? And so Suleiman was afraid that Jesus would come through the Eastern Gate, that the prophecy will be fulfilled. Even he knew about it. And so he ordered in the year 1541 AD, he says, close up the gate. He ordered that it be built over. And this was only three years after he had actually rebuilt this gate. He rebuilt all the walls of Jerusalem, but he ordered that this gate will be shut so that the Messiah could not enter But, you know, this shows us that it's important to know the whole Bible, not just little parts and quotes and the the parts that we like, but to know the whole Bible because the prophecy of Ezekiel continues. And it says that the Lord said to me, this gate is to remain shut. It must not be reopened. No one may enter through it. It is to remain shut because the Lord, the God of Israel, has entered through it. The prince himself is the only one who may sit inside the gateway to eat in the presence of the Lord. He is to enter by way of the portico of the gateway and go out in the same way. 
you know, Suleiman, with all of his power, you know, the Ottoman Empire was a massive, massive empire. All that power that he had, the knowledge, the wealth, the influence. But despite all of this, Suleiman did not know that he was fulfilling the prophecy, that he was helping to make God's word into action. He unknowingly helped fulfill this prophecy. And how many times do we see in the Bible throughout history, we see Pharaoh, we see Cyrus, we see Nebuchadnezzar, even Caesar himself, unknowingly to themselves, they help to fulfill God's prophecy, God's promises, God's decrees. So this Eastern Gate, it was not just the name, it was not the convenience location, but because of its significance, its theological significance, that Jesus entered through this way. And actually the Jewish people, because they do not recognize Jesus as their Messiah, they are still waiting for their Messiah to come through the Eastern Gate. They are still waiting. So now that we know where Jesus entered, how did Jesus enter? How did Jesus enter Jerusalem? It says with great fanfare and applause. It says that crowds had gathered to cheer Jesus' name. Hosanna to the son of David. Hosanna in the highest. All of these people were just so caught up in the hype of Jesus entering into Jerusalem. And so the authorities, we are, remember, as we said, the religious authorities, the Roman authorities, they were in Jerusalem, right? It was the Passover period. So they were definitely in Jerusalem. And they saw this. They saw Jesus coming in through the Eastern Gate. And they saw how the crowds received him, how they welcomed him in as a hero. He entered Jerusalem as a victorious conqueror, as the Messiah. And the people around were so filled with excitement. They could not control themselves. The disciples by Jesus' side, they could not contain their ambition, their raw ambition. We have to know that they are very ambitious people because they felt that their rise to power under Jesus was coming soon. They knew that it was upon them. And the people that were in power, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the high priests, the Romans even, watched and they could do nothing. And so they started whispering in the shadows. They said, this Jesus is a problem. Someone needs to do something about it. Someone needs to do something about him. But we see that the worldly expectation was not in line with the spiritual reality of the situation. See, no one except Jesus really knew this, but Jesus was not coming to be celebrated. Jesus was not coming to be victorious, but he had come to Jerusalem first to die, to be tortured and murdered, executed. He came to die. We saw from last week's reading, Jesus says, we are going up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and they will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. But on the third day, he will be raised to life. And how did the disciples respond? They didn't care. They did not hear anything that Jesus had to say. They ignored him and they began to ask Jesus, who will sit at your right and on your left? Who will be in the highest position of power? That was their response. They were so fixated on this idea of victory that they could not even imagine defeat. 
They cannot even imagine in their minds. What are you, Jesus mocked, flogged, crucified, death? What are you talking about, Jesus? What are you talking about? We're going to have a great time in Jerusalem. That was their thought process. We're going to have a great time. It's going to be amazing. Look at these people. They're welcoming you, Jesus. You know, it's like kids going to a, a amusement park, like to Everland. The kids are so excited. They're like, this is going to be amazing. And the parents are like, oh. Now it begins. The suffering begins. For Jesus, this was not going to be a good time. The triumphal entry into Jerusalem did not result in triumph for Jesus and his disciples. Now, of course, we are talking strictly about the intermediate period between Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday. Right? We know, of course, how it ends. We know how the story ends. But in this meantime, Jerusalem was a place of defeat. It was a place of death. The disciples thought that their little parade that they were having, that the cheering crowds meant that everything would go okay, that everything would be smooth sailing afterwards. But that was not the case. The situation was about to change. In the investment world, there is a very important saying. And every investor, if you are a novice or an expert, no matter, it doesn't matter what your level is, you should know this saying. Past performance does not guarantee future results. If anyone tells you something different when they try to offer you an investment, that means they are lying. They're trying to steal your money. You know, as someone who sells investments, I could lose my license if I don't tell people this one simple fact, that past performance does not guarantee future results. And in the same way, Jesus entering into Jerusalem in this way, in this triumphal entry through the East Gate, as foretold by prophecy, with all of these people gathered and screaming his name, all of these things, it seemed like a clear signal of success, that everything was okay. But that was just a worldly situation. The spiritual situation before Easter was very different. Jesus had to drink from a cup of great suffering. Jesus had to empty himself and make himself into nothing like a servant and become obedient even to death on a cross. Now again, we all know the ending that comes later. We know the happy ending that comes later. We know what happens on Easter Sunday. Spoiler alert, Jesus lives again. We know that. Jesus will be victorious over death. But in the intermediate time, in that middle period before Easter, this was not the experience that was awaiting Jesus and his disciples. Their time in Jerusalem would not be spent as heroes, but as zeros. They would be made into nothing. How many of us can enter through this golden gate, through the double doors of mercy and repentance? Do we expect to find only good things in store for us? Do we expect to find comfort and pleasure in Jerusalem? But Jesus has called us to more than that on this Palm Sunday. And we will read his words as we close. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Let us pray together. Dear Lord, we thank you for Jesus who entered into Jerusalem, O Lord. 
And although the crowds cheered his name, we know, Lord Father God, what was waiting for him in that city. That it was death and suffering. That it was a cup that was so heavy and so bitter. Dear Lord, we pray, Lord, that we would not get caught up in the worldly situation. That we would always be aware of the spiritual realities of the Lord. We know, Lord Father God, that you have called us to carry a cross. And that at times that cross can be heavy. It can be burdensome. But this is our calling, O Lord. And so we will bear it gratefully. Dear Lord, before we celebrate the victory of Easter, O Lord, let us dwell on Jesus' suffering, his death in this Palm Sunday and Holy Week. We pray all of this together in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Pray over this offering together. Dear Lord, we truly we surrender all to you, Lord. We pray that our time, our finances, our thoughts, O oh Lord, would all be bound to you, to your will, to your kingdom. We pray, Lord Father God, that you would work through us, O oh Lord, that you would use us, especially to bring relief to those who are in need, O oh Lord Father. For truly in this you are pleased and you are glorified. We thank you and we pray all of this together in the name of Jesus Christ. Oh, yeah. Amen. Amen. Thank you again so much, everyone, for joining us for our Awake Ministries uh, worship. Uh, we ask that you would continue praying, especially for those who are suffering from COVID, from uh, other health um, issues. We have a lot of people that are out right now. Um, so please continue to pray for them. Also, uh, as we mentioned in the announcements, next Sunday is Easter and we are, uh, have the theme, the reason for hope, just as our uh, main worship does. And then uh, we will have the theme uh, reaching higher for our 23rd anniversary. So next week, Sunday, the 17th is Easter Sunday. And as you have all heard also in the main sanctuary, uh, it is worship together. So. We encourage everyone, if possible, to come and worship here in person. Uh, anyone who is watching through YouTube who is still holding out at home, we're talking to you. 
uh, come join us next Sunday as we uh, have many great things planned for our Easter Sunday. And also for our anniversary service on the 24th, uh, we pray that you will come join us as well because it will be a very good time. Uh, we have a nice present uh, prepared for all of you beautiful people. Uh, so please come join and enjoy with us. Now let us rise together as we conclude our service. Let us turn to our neighbor and say, Hosanna. 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 Let us sing together. Hosanna.
pray, Lord, now that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, who calls up to take the cross, and the love of the Almighty Father God, whose presence will pass through the Eastern Gate, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, who guides us in each day, that it will be with the members of our Awake Ministries and Myung Sung Church, now and forever. Amen. Amen.